Welcome back. In this session, I'd like to move from data descriptives to distributions. In data descriptives, we look for summary statistics that tell us more about the data. Measures of centrality, measures of dispersion, measures of skewness, measures of kurtosis, and you see, saw those all come into play. But the reality is visual displays of information are often more gripping than giving you numbers. So if I could take the data that I have and provide it in the form of a picture, my guess is that you will learn more by looking at that picture than from metrics. That's what we accomplish when we take data and we create what are called histograms or bar charts to show you what the dispersion of the data looks like. Now, once you have a histogram or a bar chart, you might be able to find <clears throat> a classic statistical distribution. There are literally dozens of them that fit your data. You're saying, what do I gain by doing it? You gain the benefits of all of the work statisticians have done on those distributions. So if your data resembles a normal distribution, well, guess what? You just got lucky. There are so many more things we know about normal distributions that you can bring into play with your data. So let's start with how you decide what distribution fits your data. So if you take your, your, your sample observations and after you computed your data descriptives, you basically classify them and put it into a chart. You can present your data in one of two ways. If your data is discrete, you can present it as a bar chart. If your data is continuous, you can present it as a histogram. Let me give you two examples. Remember that PE data that I showed you in the, in the, in the previous session? We looked at the average, the median, and then I looked at regional values for cost of capital or PE ratios. If I broke down my global sample into parts of the world, and I computed a P ratio for each part of the world, then one way I can present this with a bar chart. I can take each part of the world, show you what the P ratio looks like in that part of the world. That's what a bar chart did. In a histogram, I stayed with the raw data, P ratios, cost of capital. I break that data down into ranges, and then I look at how many companies fall within the range. So in the example of PE ratios, I break it down 0 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, and then I look at how many, I count, just basically count every company there's a PE ratio between 0 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 10, and I put it up into a histogram. Bar charts and histograms are designed to convey more information about the data in a visual way. But as I said, once you have a histogram, you can look for distributions that then can be used to fit your data. Now, a little later when we get to the applied section, I'll talk about ways in which you can decide which distribution is right for you. But in this session, I want to focus broadly on what the things are that you might focus on in deciding which distribution best fits. The distribution you're looking for is the one that best fits your data in terms of symmetry. If your data is symmetric, you want a symmetric distribution. Skewness. If your data is asymmetric, then you want to make sure you fit a distribution that reflects its skewness. And in terms of tails, remember we talked about likelihood of extreme values, fat tails, thin tails. You want to get the distribution that best fits your data. And as I said, the benefits of using a standardized distribution is there's a great deal we know about these distributions that you can then use on your data. So let's start with symmetric distributions and let's start with everybody's favorite, the normal distribution. Picture of a normal distribution. There's the average. There's plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations. 99% plus of all observations in your data should fall within three standard deviations of your average if you have a normal distribution. So one very simple way to test to see if your distribution is normal is to look to see how many observations fall more than three standard deviations away. If 3% or 5% or 7% of your sample fall outside three standard deviations, your data is not normal. So let's take a closer look at what the normal distribution brings in. The first is the standard deviation of the normal distribution measures the spread around the mean, but the spread is in both directions. 
And that spread can then be used to make statements about the likelihood of getting an obs observation that's very different from the average, the plus one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviations. A normal distribution is absolutely symmetric. It's got a skewness of zero. And while the normal distribution has tails, it becomes the standard against which all other distributions are measured. In fact, the kurtosis of a normal distribution is three. So once you compute the kurtosis for your data, if it's much higher than three, then you have a distribution with fatter tails than a normal distribution. If it's less than three, you have a distribution with thinner tails. Dispersion, skewness, kurtosis. So as I said, normal distribution is everybody's favorite because it allows you to do so much more with your data. But what if you're working with a small sample, 20, 25, 30 observations? There's a distribution that looks a lot like the normal distribution called the t-distribution. The way to think about the t-distribution is it's got a lower peak and bigger tails than a normal distribution. You can see the contrast. There's the normal distribution, there's the t-distribution. And as the sample size gets smaller, the t-distribution gets more and more, you know, you can see the peak falls and the tails become wider. If you have a really small sample, sometimes a t-distribution might be a better distribution that fits your data than a normal distribution. But they're all symmetric. Now, staying on the theme of symmetric distributions, there's a distribution that I use actually surprisingly frequently called a triangular distribution. Take a look at the triangular distribution versus the normal distribution. First, it's a lot more jagged. It's not got the smooth edges of a normal distribution is. But notice also that it's bounded on the upside and the downside. When we talked about boundedness in your data, that in investing in finance, data sometimes comes with bounds, sometimes bounds on both sides. Your number cannot exceed a certain number, it cannot fall below a certain number. If that is the case, you cannot use a normal distribution for your data because the normal distribution, if you, think, if you look at the graph, allows for values ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. A triangular distribution is a symmetric distribution, but it's got a more pronounced peak. That's the tip of the triangle, and it's got bounce. So again, if your data is bounded, it's got a more decided peak, a triangular distribution might fit. And there's one final symmetric distribution. It's called the uniform distribution. It's bounded as well. But basically, the chance of getting a value any, num any number between the two bounds is equal. In other words, if I told you that your margins can be anywhere from 10 to 20%, but I said, look, I have absolutely no idea where. My priors about your margins are too diffuse. I know too little about your margins. You have a uniform distribution. So think of even with symmetric distributions, your choices. You have the normal distribution, you've got a t-distribution, you've got a triangular distribution, you've got a uniform distribution. They're all symmetric though. You're saying, what if I have a skew in my distribution? Well, I can find a distribution that best fits your skew. If your skew is towards negative values, there's a distribution called a minimum extreme value distribution. And you can see what it looks like, right? If you have a histogram where your tail stretches out on the negative side, but it's, P, it's bounded on the positive side, a oh, minimum extreme value distribution allows you to reflect that. Your average will reflect the fact that you have a big negative tail, but you have lots of outliers on the downside of the distribution. If your distribution, so this might be a distribution used for profit margins. Remember I said profit margins have an upper extreme, a higher bound of 100%, but there is no lower bound. But if your distribution has a positive skew, like stock prices, even returns, there's an alternate distribution that reflects a positive skew. It's called the log normal distribution. It's not the only positive skew distribution, just as the minimum extreme is not the only negative skew distribution. But a log normal distribution is a distribution you might run into a lot in finance. In a log normal distribution, the peak is to the left, the tail is to the right. You have more possibility of extreme outliers, as in the case of PE ratios or stock returns. How much the skew is in a log normal distribution will be a function of what standard deviation you give the distribution. 
the higher the standard deviation, the more positive skew there will be to the distribution. Which brings me to tails in the distribution. A normal distribution is tails, but if your data has fatter tails, more likelihood of extreme values, you got what's called a fat tail distribution. Again, there's a whole range of distributions with fatter tails in a normal distribution. It's a Pareto distribution, for instance, that some people argue is a better distribution to use on stock prices and returns in a normal distribution. That's up for debate in a different session. But fat tail distributions allow you to capture that. Now, once you've decided your distributional tails matter, there's a simple measure you can use to decide whether your distribution fits a normal distribution or has fatter tails or even thinner tails. And that measure, of course, is the kurtosis. If you remember, the kurtosis of a normal distribution is three. Now there's a measure of kurtosis called Pearson's kurtosis and it's very simple. Here's what you do. You take the kurtosis of your distribution and you subtract out three. It's ex the excess number over three. And it's going to tell you whether your distribution has tails that resemble a normal distribution or whether you need to diverge. If your Pearson kurtosis is close to three, zero, which basically means your regular kurtosis is close to three, then you have tails like a normal distribution. Those distributions are called mesocurtic distributions. If the Pearson kurtosis is less than zero, then your distribution's actual kurtosis is less than three, your distribution has thin tails. It's called a platycurtic distribution. I know these are strange sounding words, and if you want to forget the words and just think about the kurtosis, that's fine too. And if your Pearson kurtosis is greater than zero, then your distribution has fat tails. It's called a leptocurtic distribution. So when you get your data, you can compute measures of central value, you can get the skewness, you can get the kurtosis, but the end of the process, you should at least have a sense of what the key descriptives of your data look like. Is it symmetric? Is it skewed? What do its tails look like? Because you're trying to find a distribution that best fits your data. So here's a very simple flowchart, or you might not think it's not simple, but it's the simplest I could think of of finding a distribution that best fits your data. So let's say you have data, it could be any data, and you're trying to fit a distribution around it. Here are some of the key questions you need to ask. And the answers you give to these questions will drive you to specific distributions. Up front, let me tell you that the distributions I've listed here are not comprehensive. There are dozens of dozens of other distributions that might also fit the bill. I've just given a sampling of distributions. If your data is continuous, you can take any value and it's symmetric. We talked about the three choices. You can use a normal distribution, a triangular distribution, a uniform distribution, or a close relative, the T distribution. But within those symmetric distributions, if your tails are, you know, are, are thinner than a normal distribution, you might have to pick a, a symmetric distribution with thin tails. You, could, you can't go with the normal. So based on whether your data is symmetric and what type of tails it is, you have a pick of distributions. If your data is asymmetric, as we saw, it depends on which direction the skewness is. You can find a distribution, whether it's minimum extreme or log normal, or even the exponential, which is extremely right-tailed, if that fits your data. If your data is discrete, and we don't run into that much discrete data in finance, and you know what the and you can estimate the possible outcomes and properties. You can just specify a property distribution. You don't need to go with one of the statistical distributions. But if you cannot, there again the push the follow up is I'm going to ask you: Is the data symmetric or asymmetric? What do the outliers look like? Because within discrete distributions, you can have a range of distributions. The binomial, for instance, is a symmetric discrete distribution. But there's a version of the binomial called the negative binomial that's right skewed. And there's a version of the discrete distribution called the hypergeometric that's left skewed. I know it's a lot that I'm throwing at you. And I don't expect you to remember these distributions. But I want you to keep your focus on discrete versus continuous, symmetric versus asymmetric, skewed versus not skewed, positively skewed versus negatively skewed. And whether your tails are fatter or thinner than the normal distribution. Because those choices you make will depend on what you find in your data. I hope you found the session useful.
and thank you very much for listening.